<clears throat> All right, you guys are there in Luke 15. We'll read at verse 11. It says, and he said unto it, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Let's pray. Dear Father God, I thank you so much for this wonderful day. I thank you so much for everything you do for us, God. Thank you so much for a group of zealous believers that want to hear your word preach, God. And there are many churches in town they could have went to tonight, God. And I just pray that uh, you'd be with me as I preach this sermon, God. And I help, help me speak words that are edifying, God. Help me to have a clear train of thought, God. And help me to be wise with my words, God. And I pray there'd be no distractions during the service, God, and that everybody could uh, take something home from my message, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the title of my sermon is called Tough Love. Tough Love. And just some context behind this sermon. You know, people nowadays have lost the meaning of what real love actually is in this world. A lot of people think that love is just like a mushy, gushy feeling that you get when you fall in love with girls at 16, you know. That's not all that love actually is, though. And the Bible is very clear about that. And some, and there's a difference between godly love and between the love of the world, okay? And the, the feeling of love, that is a real feeling. But when the Bible talks about love, it's not just talking about that gushy feeling you feel. It's talking about obeying the commandments of God, which we'll see later on, uh, as I'm about to show you. But, you know, people think that love nowadays just has to be always kind. It has to always be gentle. It can never be offensive. But that doesn't line up with what the Bible actually says about love. You know, and there is some love that is kind. And, there, and when you can be kind and when you can be gentle with someone, you should try to do that. But some love is just tough. Some love just, you know, has to be abrasive. It's, it doesn't make you feel good. But sometimes tough love is necessary for us as Christians. And what is tough love? The, the dictionary definition says is an exp, uh, tough love is an expression used when someone treats another person harshly or sternly with the intent to help them in the long run. So, you know, people think that love is just all about a feeling, all about all, always being kind. But the Bible, you know, uh, and this story perfectly illustrates that there's a type of love that you can have for someone that always isn't, uh, you know, super nice and super gentle uh, and, and super uh, mushy gushy, as people like to say. But go, if you would, to Leviticus 19, 17. And this is a perfect example of this. In Leviticus 19, 17, because people think love is just always lovey-dovey. It can't be offensive at all. But some of the most offensive things I've ever heard in my life have actually been the most loving things that have come into my life. And we as Christians need to learn that just because you're criticized or someone you know is telling you, correcting you, that doesn't mean it's hateful. It just means it's tough love. Uh, look at Leviticus 19, 17. It says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Uh, verse 18 says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. And that's the famous phrase that people will take and say, see, look right there. You know, the Bible says in the Old Testament that you're supposed to be always loving. And in the New Testament, Jesus quotes that. And you're always supposed to be loving. You should always be super kind and compassionate to everybody you meet. But that doesn't line up with what the Bible actually says. And that's why it's good not to get your doctrine from a bunch of atheists that just rip the scripture out of context. You know, if you'd read the entirety of the Bible, you'd understand what it means when it says, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Because it doesn't mean that you get to dis disobey the law of God just to show the mushy, gushy feeling of love. Actually, when you execute the law, you're actually doing what God calls the love of God. Uh, and let me show this to you. Go to 2 John 1.6. 2 John 1 6. 2 John 1 6. The Bible says in 2 John 1 6, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. And in 1 John 5 2, it says, By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments. Uh, in first John, in the next verse, number three, it says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So the Bible actually doesn't say here that love is just a mushy, gushy feeling. It's not always lovey dovey. Love is when we keep the commandments of God. That's what the Bible says. So when you have verses from the Old Testament that seem harsh, just know that that's what true love really is, you know? And I had you there in Leviticus. Go back to Leviticus 19. You know, the Bible says in John 14, 15, if you love me, 
keep my commandments. You know, people are you know, deceived nowadays and they think, well, when the Bible says to put someone to death, that's not real love. You know, when the Bible actually says to put someone to death, that's what real love is. And they have it completely backwards that they think that love is just a mushy gushy feeling, but it's not always just a feeling. It's an action. It's obeying God's commandments. That's what real love is is. So I, I read this earlier. It says, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. And that's a great verse. But if you would go to the next chapter uh, in Leviticus 20, 13, because this, this is the, this is what's ironic about people is they'll use that verse that Jesus is quoting in the new Testament to say that all these things are done away with in the old Testament. But if they would just look at the next chapter of the Bible, they would see that that's not true at all. Cause in Leviticus 20, 13, it said, if a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. What happened? Did the Bible just contradict itself? No. What the Bible is saying here is that real love is obeying God's commandments. That's what real love is. And why is it loving? See, people are confused and think that you have to love every single person. Sometimes the action of love that you do is for a majority of people to save that majority of people rather than just the one oddball. A good example of that is, you know, homosexuality. But also in Genesis 9, 6, it says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for uh, in... Uh, uh, the image of God made he man. So you see, people would say, well, that's not very loving to put someone to death, but that is loving for the rest of the people in the world that don't have to be, that, that don't have to worry about getting murdered by this guy. This is loving for that victim's family that has to deal with the loss of that because of this murderous man. That's what real love is. That's what real justice is. And people think that the death penalty should be done away with. That's completely against the Bible. That's a completely against the New Testament and the Old Testament. The Bible says if someone's a rapist, that person should be put to death. Someone who's a pedophile should be put to death. Someone who lies with an animal should be put to death. And that's not hate. That's what real love is. That's what the Bible says. Good. And people have that completely backwards nowadays. We shouldn't let the world define our terms as Christians. You know, when we define anything, it should be from the Bible. And the Bible says that the way we show love is by obeying God's commandments. And that includes Leviticus 20, 13. Amen. And there's more commandments than just that. But that's just the example that people will try to pin against itself. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. You just pull scriptures out of context and then you think that you sound really smart for it. I had a guy at work, you know, he was like, oh, you believe that, uh, you know, you think that people should be put to death because we were talking about capital punishment. He's like, but don't you know the Bible says thou shalt not kill? It's like, oh, he got me, man. <laughs> but no, it's actually that if you read the next couple chapters, then it lays out a list of people that should be put to death because it's not murder to put someone to death that has broken the law of God. Uh, that's, a, that's a just putting to death. That's not an innocent, cold-blooded murder. That's what God commands in the Bible. That's what real love is. Uh, and with that being said, go, if you would, to Luke 15, back to the story of the prodigal son, because that's what we're going to be focusing in on. You know, we've, we've come to a place in society that we want to not offend everybody so much that we actually treat the, you know, the murderer and the rapist more lovingly than we actually treated the victim or its family. You know, I seen that guy named Brock Turner that got away with uh, the rape case. He was only in jail for six months. It's like, what does the world come to? You know, that guy ruined that girl's life and then he gets out in six months. That's wicked as hell. He should be put to death is what the Bible says. And that's not hate. That's love for that girl and her family that you actually don't care about because you want to just put him in jail. Why would you put someone in jail and waste money? Just put them to death if they're worthy of death. <clears throat> I had you guys go to Luke, you know, and with that all being said, I, I would just like to show you tonight that, you know, when we're being loving as Christians, the world may not see it as love, but it's just what tough love is, you know, and when, and when you're a parent and you're raising your kids, sometimes you have to be harsh and stern with them, but that's still love too, because love isn't only just a feeling. And point one of my sermon is tough love is what's doing the best for someone not what makes them feel good. Uh, so you guys are there in Leviticus, or excuse me, in Luke 15. Uh, look at verse 11 again. We'll read it over. It says, And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together uh, and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. 
Now, the first thing I'd like to point out about this is what, you know, there's a spiritual application to the story, but I'd like to actually focus on the story itself, the, you know, uh, the physical application of this story. Uh, and, and the first thing I'd like to point out is that this father was not right for giving this kid all of his inheritance. You know, you know, sometimes as a parent, your kids are going to ask you to do things for them that you should not do for them. You know, it was not wise once he saw that his kid's heart to give him all of his inheritance early. If he knew that he was going to go blow it, that was, that dad should have never done that and he set his son up in a position right there to fail and you know the, what people confuse nowadays is they want to make their kids happy they just want to please their kids but doing what's you know what pleases your kids is not what's doing the best for them all the time sometimes you, you know it'll line up but sometimes your kid has a rebellious heart or has wickedness in their heart and they're going to want something uh that's not good for them and you as a parent need to be the person that says no that's not going to happen in my house i'm not going to let you listen to worldly music in my house i'm not going to let you watch tv in my house because I'm the boss of my house and I know what's better for you and you're just a kid and that's tough love that's tough that's not the nicest thing in the world uh, for kids to hear but it's tough love that's what's good for a kid is when the parent you know makes decisions for them not just based on how they feel about it but based on what's best for that kid uh, and the second thing I'd like you to notice though about this story is that you know, uh, this man must have failed this kid somewhere in his life growing up. Because if you would go to uh, Proverbs 22, 6 real quick. See, this man, well, the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. See, when you raise your kids according to the Bible, the Bible's clear right there. It says they will not depart from the way of the Lord. If you're raising your kids right they're going to grow up and they're going to continue following the, day, the commandments of God until the day that they die, is what the Bible says. Uh, but a lot of parents don't, you know, they don't raise up their kids in the way that they should go anymore. They just try to give them whatever's pleasing to their kids. They try to make their kids happy over doing what's best for them. Look, if your kid's asking for a, a chocolate bar every night before they go to bed, that's not what's best for them. It'll probably make them happy in the short term. Uh, but then when, at the end of their life, when they're 300 pounds, they're going to turn around and <laughs> hate you for it, you know? Uh, but, you know, the, this man clearly in this story did not raise up his kid in the way that he should go because this, he departed from it. Right here is what uh, the story is telling us. And we see two fatal flaws that he does. He gives him his money to go and ruin his life, which he should never have done just to please his son. But also somewhere down the line, he must have not been raising his kid right. Because if his kid had the courage to go up to him and say, hey, dad, I want my money. I'm going to go live however I want. You're not training that kid right. You know, I've never even considered in my mind going up to my dad and saying, hey, give me my inheritance. I'm going to go live wherever I want or live however I want. My dad would have given me my inheritance to pay for the hospital bills at that point that I was going to be suffering. From. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, it's good for kids to have a healthy fear of their parents. It's good for a kid uh, not to just be in an abusive relationship with their parents. But, you know, the Bible talks about fearing the Lord. A kid should have fear for their parents as well. You know, you know, my dad. Uh, I had some times where I got spanked when I was a kid. I got beaten pretty bad as a kid, you know, never abusively, but always in love. And that made me a better person nowadays. I would never take any of the spankings back that my parents gave me because they made me turn out to be a better person than I would have been without them. And if my parents never would have spanked me when I was a kid, I would have turned out to be a little brat, you know, I would have turned out to be a punk, you know, and that's how kids turn out to be a lot of days is they turn out to be rebellious kids because their parents don't spank them. You should be spanking your kids. And you might say, well, why is it? 21 year old telling me to do what to do with my kids it's because I know what kind of works because it worked on me I mean my dad spanked me enough so, so it worked uh but go back to the story with Luke just keep your finger in Luke 15 because I'm going to keep going back there <clears throat> but you know rather than this father being a man and saying look I'm not going to give you inheritance you know you're just going to go and blow it he gives it to him just to please his son right there uh, and also his kid didn't even have a, a, a fear to go up to his dad and ask for that. So there must have been something wrong with how he was uh, raising that kid when he was younger. Uh, but look at, if you would, in verse 13, it says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, uh, there arose a mighty famine in, the, in, in that land, and he began to be in want, and he went and joined himself in, uh, to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields uh, to feed swine, and he would fain uh, have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave 
unto him. And if you want your kid to turn out like this, if you want your kid to turn out like a lazy bum that's homeless, that doesn't have a good job, that can't have a good relationship, then just give them whatever they want. That's the moral of the story right here. If you just want your kids to turn out like the world, just give them every single thing they want and they'll end up just like this man right here. Because there's no new thing under the sun. This man wasn't just an odd case. It's because his dad, when he was younger, he just gave him whatever he wanted. When he got older, he gave him his his inheritance. And then when he was older, he went and blew it all because his parent did not raise this kid right. And he was not man enough to tell his kid, I'm not going to give you this money because you're going to ruin your life. And you as a parent need to realize that if you have to make your kids sad sometimes, that's okay if it's for the best. You know, there was multiple things that my dad did in my life where I didn't agree with him, but guess what? He was right and I was wrong because I was a kid and I didn't know any better. And as a parent, you need to realize that your kid's going to have their own opinions sometimes and that's okay, but you need to realize that if their opinions are not aligned up with yours, your opinion should trump theirs every single time as a parent. But if you want your kid to ruin their life, this is the textbook way to do it. Don't raise them right. Don't spank them when they're younger and give them whatever they want. Let them listen to whatever music they want. And they're going to end up in a pig pen just like this guy, you know, with no food and no job and no relationships. But I want you to notice this next phrase in Luke 17. This is the most important phrase. It says, and when he came to himself, and even before that, if you'd back up into verse 16 at the very end of it, it says, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, see right here, this man realizes that he's hit rock bottom. And a lot of parents don't let, you know, the, the, these kids hit rock bottom. And if you have, if you have, if you have a kid that's not, that's rebellious, you know, that's out of your house, that's just like this story, you shouldn't be just always trying to help that kid out. You need to let them hit the bottom of where they're going to be. It's the same principle with people who are homeless is a good example. You know, people always are rushing to give homeless people money, but that's not really loving because that just makes them ruin their life worse. If you give a drug addict more money to get more drugs, that's not loving. That's hateful to them at that point, And you don't even realize it, you know, and if you give a drunkard, you know, money so he can go get booze, That's not loving at that point. That's disobeying the commandments of God. And why is that? Because in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, it says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would would not work, neither should he eat. The Bible says if someone doesn't work, that they shouldn't eat. That's the principle it's telling you. That the principle that it's telling you right here, that if someone is so hungry, if they actually want food, that they're going to go get some work and actually work. You know, and, and so many people nowadays, especially where I live in Portland, There's so many homeless people in the city. And why is that? Because Portland just hands out things to these people and uh, they feel bad for them. And I can understand sometimes why they feel bad for them because you know, their game is to manipulate you. But instead of saying, Hey, no, you need to hit rock bottom. You need to realize one day that you've just been wasting your life, that you've been drinking, that you've been doing drugs. Instead of letting them get to that point, they just give them money or they give them food and they keep supplying that addiction. And if you're ever going to break someone from that cycle, you know, you need to not just get enable them, you know, and, and, and it comes to the same thing when, with, with, uh, with kids too, you know, if your kid is rebellious against the things of God, uh, and they've left your house and everything like that, you shouldn't be just trying to text them every day and say, Hey, I love you. I just want to let you know that you shouldn't be trying to help them out on money. You shouldn't be trying to do those things. You need to let that kid hit rock bottom and then turn around and come home and say, Hey dad, mom, I messed up. I shouldn't have been like this. And that's obviously at the point after you fail, but you don't want to get your, you don't want your kid to get to that point in the first place. I'm talking about if this is something that's already happened to you, that's the only thing you can do is let them hit rock bottom at that point. But that verse said, it says, and when he came to himself, sometimes there's just nothing that someone's ever going to, you can never, there's some people that you can never do enough for them. You just have to let them come to themselves. You know, if you would just let these homeless people that are in Portland or wherever they are in America, if you would just let them sit outside and be cold for a little bit, if you'd let them sit outside and be hungry for a little bit and be thirsty for a little bit, they might wake up one day and say, Hey, why am I sitting here and in my own vomit and and doing drugs and thirsty and, uh, and hot? When I could just go get a job at McDonald's down the street, but people don't let them think on their own. And they think that they're being loving, but that's why the sermon is called tough love because the most loving thing you can do for that person at that point is let them hit the rock, is let them hit rock bottom. That's what you have to do at that point. And with the homeless people, with the drug addicts, with the people who are drunkards, you can never do anything financially uh, for them enough. That's going to pull them out of that. You have to let them come to themselves. 
And this is what this kid had to do right here uh, after he had wasted you know, uh, his life. He had wasted his money and he doesn't have any food and it, because nobody gave to him. It says that he came to himself. But guess what? If this dad would have been giving him money, you know, but, oh, son, I miss you, sending him letters. You know, this man's a pretty wealthy man is what the story implies. This man could have went out to him and saved him. You know, he could have went, hey, son, come back home. I'll give you some food and water. But what would have happened with that kid? He'd have been out three weeks later in a pig pen too. Because you can't just enable people. You have to let them find out things for themselves. You have to let them hit rock bottom, even if it's your kid. Uh, and even if they're a homeless person, you know, and I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want you to uh, get my words wrong. If there's someone who's on the street and they're crippled or they're blind or there's things like that, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, there's not everybody that's homeless is, is, is on the street just because, you know, they chose that wife. Uh, you know, if, and as a matter of fact, if someone Someone, if I notice that someone is blind or if they're crippled or if they're deformed or anything like that, that's the person I want to give money to those people because I want to help those people out. It's not like I'm just being stingy with my money. I don't want to fuel a drug addiction though. That's what I don't want to do. I don't want to, you know, help someone out that's just being a lazy bum and doesn't want to work. But if you would look at verse 17, <clears throat> the Bible says in verse uh, Luke 15, 17, and, and before I even get to that, what actually makes me mad about those homeless people too, is that because of that, because there's, there's a, those able-bodied men that, that are out there, they're stealing that money from the people who actually need it. Because, you know, those, that, 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 it makes me mad every time. And my dad, I didn't realize why he was so mad about it when I was younger, but now I do. It's because there's men out there like you and me that are only out there because they just want to steal people's money because they're lazy. And it wouldn't be that big of a deal if they were just stealing my money. You can have my money. I don't care. But when you're stealing money from the people that are blind and the people that you know are in a wheelchair and that are disabled mentally, that's where it's not okay anymore. But that's what you've enabled these people to do if you're just giving every homeless person you know, a dollar bill every time they walk by. Right. You, should be, you should be smart in how you hand out your money to people. But look in verse 17, it says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And that's what they have to realize. They have to realize that they've sinned. Because if you just bail them out, they're never going to realize that. Uh, and I am no uh, more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet uh, a great way off, his father saw him and in compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And, said, and the son said unto the father, or unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And you know, not only does this story illustrate tough love with just the fact that he had to be stern with his son, it also shows that, you know, when you're dealing tough love, it's not always the easiest for the person who's doing the tough love as well. And what do I mean by that? I mean, when a parent spanks their kid, they don't want to have to spank their kid. That's not something that every parent desires to do. They don't want to hurt their kid. But you have to realize, you have to put your head over your heart and realize that when you do that, when you spank your kid, it's going to make them better in the long run. And it was the same thing with this man. I mean, can you imagine how many nights this father was at home wishing that it was someone would come home and how many nights he was crying at home, just begging for his son to come home. How many times he probably thought, man, I can just go get my son right now. I can help him out right now. But this father didn't do that because he realized his mistakes. Instead of going and bailing his son out, what does he do? He lets his son come back to him. But he comes back, and when he, when he comes back, though, he lets him come back with open arms. And that's an important thing to realize, too, that if someone does come back, you, you know, the father didn't berate him right here. He showed him love and compassion. And that's what uh, you should do as well, too, if you would have a, a kid or a son that was rebellious uh, like that. Uh, but and, and it's pointed out in verse 20, it says, uh, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. I mean, do you think that it was just by chance that he saw him? Or how many days do you think that his father would go outside and look for him and say, just, man, I'm just waiting for my son to come back. But the key thing to understand here that if you bail is that is if you bail someone out, you're never going to let them come to themselves. You're never going to let them find out that they've been making a mistake in their life. You're never going to let them change their life. You're enabling that person. Uh, go, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 5.11. You know, I'm sure people could have said to this man, oh, don't you love your son? Don't you know that your son's out, you know, he doesn't have any food. He's out there with no shelter. And the father could have said, you know, I do love my son. That's why I'm not going to bail him out here. And that's the principle that the Bible is teaching here, at least on the physical side, because there's many interpretations of the Bible. Uh, <clears throat> 
But look if you would at 1 Corinthians 5, 11. It says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judges. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And just the second part I want to focus on about this tough love, about doing the best for someone and not what pleases them, is that, you know, church discipline is a perfect example of tough love. Right. When someone is kicked out of a church for being a fornicator, or for being a drunkard, or for being an idolater, that's what the Bible calls tough love love. And why do you kick people out of the church? It's not just so that you can hate that person. That's not the reason behind uh, what's written in 1 Corinthians. The reason that people get kicked out of these churches uh, are supposed to be kicked out of churches uh, for these major sins is so they can change their life around. That's the point of it. It's not to be mean to them. It's not to be hateful to them. That's not the point that Paul's writing here. He's saying that the reason that you kick this, these people out of the church is so they don't corrupt the rest of the church and so that this person can get destroyed in the flesh and that they can come back one day. And that's exactly what happens to this man in Corinthians. Uh, but look at, if you would, verse 1 of chapter 5. It said, it is, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And you know, when there becomes something that's commonly reported in the church as a sin, that's when it's time to deal with it, you know? These, I mean, where's Paul at when he's writing this? Probably not in Corinth. I mean, he's hearing about this from a different country. I mean, that's probably time to deal with that issue. And this issue was dealt with, I mean, even, it probably should have been dealt with a lot sooner but look at what Paul writes in verse 5. It says, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So right here, like I said, he's not saying this to kick people out of the church just to be a jerk to them. That's never the point of kicking someone out of the church. Uh, and when someone's kicked out of the church, the hope should be that that person can come back someday after they've changed their ways. That's the point of kicking people out of the church. Unless, of course, that person was just a Judas Iscariot, because that's the type of person you would never want back in your church, obviously. Uh, but if you would go to uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, or excuse me, go to Galatians 4.28. Galatians 4.28. But here's what I want to bring up about this while you're turning there. Is that when you interfere with these plans uh, of what God says to do with people, you're ruining their chance at restoration back to the church. Uh, or it's the same thing with a homeless person. If you're giving a homeless person money, they're never going to come back to themselves and say, hey, I should get my life turned around. I should go get a job and I should go get a, you know, a girlfriend and she'll go you know, buy a house. If you're giving them money, you're interfering with that plan right there because the Bible says if he, don't, if he doesn't work, that he shouldn't eat. And if you bail out you know, uh, your rebellious kid and you just you know, are sending them text messages every day saying, I love you, please come back home. You know, that's, you're just interfering with their plan of getting down to rock bottom. And it's the same thing with someone getting kicked out of church. If you are, are, are being all lovey-dovey with someone that's been kicked out of church, you're interfering with their restoration plan into the church. And, and what do I mean by that? Because, you know, it, it reminded me of when, you know, Tyler Baker got kicked out of Faithful Word. There were so many people that would, like, send him messages. Oh, I love you, brother. That's not what you should be doing with someone that got kicked out of the church. You, that should be a shame to them that they've got kicked out of the church. You should ignore them. You should shun them and let them be to themselves so that they can come to themselves and say, Hey, I am in a bad uh, situation right here. I need to turn my life around. And with anybody that gets kicked out of the church, that should be your philosophy. Because if you're intervening with someone like that in the future, you know, say your best friend gets kicked out of the church in the future. If that happens and you're inviting them over for dinner while they're kicked out of the church, all you're doing is ruining that person's chance to ever come back into the church. And you may think, oh, well, you know, they got kicked out. I'm just trying to be loving. I'm, I'm trying to be kind. That's not what they need right then. What they need is to be shunned. What they need is to be ashamed of themselves and realize that what they've been doing was wrong. Right. And that goes with someone who's, uh, you know, committed fornication with someone who's committed, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, someone who's committed being drunk, you know, being a drunkard and someone who's being covetous. If you're ever going to try to restore those people back in the church, you have to cut them off. You have to, you know, shun them a little bit. Just like with the father and the prodigal son, you know, you don't have to be mean to that person. That's not what I'm saying at all. You don't need to be mean. The father wasn't being mean to his son when he was out in the pig pen. Okay. He was being, you know, he just, he just didn't say anything at all. And that's the best thing you can do is just don't say anything at all. Just let him be, just let him, you know, let him suffer for a little bit and let him realize in their mind that they met 
messed up. And that's with homeless people, that's with a rebellious kid, and that's with someone who's been kicked out of the church too as well. That's tough love. And it might be tough, you know, it's tough for them, but it's also tough for the person doing it. You know, because we had someone get kicked out of our church up in Sure Foundation who I, you know, I, I, he was my decent friend up there. And, and I wanted to send him a message to be like, hey brother, I just want you to know that we still care about you. I hope you get your life around. But I didn't send that text message. You know why? Because it would have been wrong to do that. Because if you are, you know, trying to be nice to these people, you're, all you're doing is justifying what they did when they got kicked out of the church. You know, these people that were being nice to Tyler Baker when he got kicked out of Faithful Word, that should never have happened. You know, and look where he is at now, running his own uh, stupid church in Florida. <clears throat> but if you would, you guys are in Galatians 4.28. Galatians 4.28, because some people, I've heard, I've heard people even say at my church, the guy who got kicked out of my church said this, as a matter of fact. He said, well, my sin wasn't in 1 Corinthians 5, so I shouldn't have been kicked out of the church anyways. That's not the only reason you can get kicked out of a church in the Bible. And you're there in Galatians 4.28, it says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so, or even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. You know, when Paul's writing that list in Corinthians, he doesn't, he doesn't have to list every single sin that someone should be kicked out of the church for. I mean, he doesn't mention murder there. Do you think that someone who's a murderer who just committed cold blood yesterday should be able to be allowed in the church? Not at all, because some of those things are at the pastor's discretion. And that's why, you know, the pastor's ordained to be the man of God of the church. And that's why when he does a decision, you trust what he does uh, when it lines up with the Bible. But this verse says right here, this doesn't say that these per this person was a, you know, a, you know, a fornicator or, or it wasn't a, you know, a drunkard. It says that these people were the people that are spreading heresy in the church. Heresy is a reason to get kicked out of the church. Someone who's being rebellious all the time is a reason to get kicked out of the church. Amen. Matthew 18 talks about how if someone, you know, if they have a problem with their brother, uh, and then you can go with two or three witnesses, and then you can have the whole church that he goes before, and then that person get kicked out for whatever it is for their... You know, there's not only those reasons why someone could get kicked out of the church. That, those reasons why someone gets kicked out of, out of the church should be at the pastor's discretion. And when the pastor decides it, that's what you should agree with uh, <clears throat> according to the Bible. But if you guys would go to uh, Proverbs 13, 24. You might say it's tough love to kick someone out of the church. It is tough love, you know. It, 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 it could be hard for you if you were friends with that person, it can be hard for you, and it should be hard for that person especially, and they should feel ashamed of themselves. And that's the goal, and you shouldn't interfere with those things, and you shouldn't interfere with a homeless person's uh, matters as well, uh, like I said earlier. But anyways, uh, you know, something just to, like I said, just to throw it out there one more time, that, it, you know, if your friend in the future, you know, you're going to make good friends at this church, and that's a great thing. You know, your friend in the future could do something to get themselves kicked out of the church, and I just want to warn you, I just want to tell you and, and make it really clearly known that if your friend was to be kicked out in the future, you know, the best thing you could do for them at that point is to just cut them off and let them come to themselves. And if they don't come to themselves, then they're just prideful, and they shouldn't be in the church anyways. <clears throat> You guys are there in uh, Proverbs 13, 24. You know, point one of the sermon is tough love doesn't, uh, tough love isn't what makes someone feel good. It's what's the best for someone. Uh, but continuing on with that point, you guys are in Proverbs 13, 24. It says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. And, and I was talking about how, you know, if a kid was rebellious and they were completely out of your house, you know, that's how you're recovering them is with tough love. But like I said, you don't want them to ever get to that point in the first place. And in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, I've seen a lot of parents that will do an excellent job as spanking their kids, you know, but then, well, the problem wasn't that they didn't spank their kids because that's only like 50% of what you have to do as a parent, but then they just didn't set up enough rules in the first place that they should have been spanked for. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I've seen parents that are good that every time a person, you know, every time that kid uh, talks back to their mom and dad, 
They, they get spanked every time, but then that same parent is letting their kids watch, you know, filth on the television, you know? If there's only one rule in your house for your kid, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. You should have multiple rules in your house uh, uh, for your children. And a good example of this is in 2 Corinthians 6, 14. It says, Be ye not uh, unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And, you know, as a parent, you need to make sure that your kids are hanging out with people uh, that are good for them. And it goes on to say, And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You know, those verses are pretty clear that we shouldn't be best buds with someone who's not saved, right? That, that, that's pretty clear. Um, but who are your kids hanging around, parents? Are you letting your kids hang around worldly people that, you know, uh, are backslidden uh, just because you don't want to hurt your kids' feelings? I've seen many parents that will just allow something that kid, their kids do just because they don't want to hurt their feelings. You know, that should never be your attitude as a parent. You know, a good example of this in my life uh, was with my dad. I had a friend when I was younger who was my best friend. I mean, he like we were, we were friends since we were born, it seemed like. And that kid uh, was from a single parent house and he wasn't a very great kid, you know, looking back on him. He was always getting into trouble. He was always exposing me to things that weren't great, you know, uh, but we were best buds. And, but he, I mean, he got me to do things that I usually wouldn't do, you know, nothing too crazy, but he would just, he's just a bad influence. He was a cancer in my life. He just brought me down. That's all he did. And, you know, one time we got caught sneaking out at like 3 a.m. in the morning and we were in like seventh grade maybe or something like that <laughs> you know just like going outside because we thought it was cool whatever but you know at that point my dad was already shady you know he thought that that guy was shady but then after that my dad said you're done with that friendship right there and you know of course I was his best friend so you know I didn't think that that was you know cool I didn't think that was a very great thing that my dad did and as a matter of fact I was really bitter against my dad when he did that for a very long time in my childhood you know I was very angry that he cut that relationship off you know, but you know what, looking back on it, I'm so happy my dad did that because it's not, I wasn't wise in that situation. You know, I was hanging out with someone I shouldn't have, but my dad was man enough to say, I'm cutting that relationship off. You're not going to be friends with him any longer. And that's one of the best things that's ever happened to me because you know, those things that I used to do with them, I've never done those things again. The only reason I did any of the bad things that I did when I was younger, uh, was because I was with him is what it would seem like. And my dad had enough man in him to say, you're done with that friendship. And I didn't like that and I was bitter against my dad for that and I was really angry for a long time but now I look back as an adult and say dad I thank you so much you did that because that was one of the best things you ever did for me there's another story like that in my life you know when I was 17 I, I wasn't even allowed to date when I was until I was 17 years old and you know of course if you're going to public school that's ultra lame you know when you're <laughs> when you can't date when you're in public school you're the loser you ain't got a girlfriend it's like what but you know my parents weren't like really zealous back then, so they really they had us in public school, which would probably be a mistake anyways. Uh, but my dad, even when I was in public school and just growing up, even if we weren't super zealous, he was very strict with the rules that he had on me and my life. And I thought that they were so dumb when I was younger. Why couldn't I be friends with this guy? Why can't I date someone, you know, until I'm 17? That's what he said. But you know what? I'm so glad that my dad did that looking back. And I was temporarily very bitter with my dad. I was angry at at him for a long time and they knew that I was angry at them and it affected our relationship for the worse momentarily but you know what now I'm closest to my dad that I've ever been in my whole life and I'm thankful for that because I can look back and say look back at my life and say dad I just thank you so much that you did everything that even when I wanted to hang out with that stupid kid you said no because I'm your boss and I know more than you and, you know, when I wanted to date someone when I was in middle school, you know, my dad said, no, you're not going to do that because I'm the boss of you. And I was mad at my dad, but that's some of the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life. You know why? Because when I got married, I was married a virgin. And that's a great thing. When I was married, I didn't even kiss anybody until it was my own wife at the altar. You know, when I, I didn't ever, you know, I have a, now I have a wonderful job. I have a wonderful wife. I have a wonderful church that I go to. You know, my life is super blessed. And I look back, look, look back at it all and I realize that was all because of my dad. That was because my dad was loving and he was man enough to tell me this is what you're going to do in my house. And as a parent, if your kids are doing things you don't want them to do, you just need to be a man and say, you know what? You're not going to do that in my house. You know, whatever you don't want them to do. And with my dad, 
you know, it, it was, we weren't allowed to date until I was 17. And, and that's a great thing. I got married a virgin. Like I said, that was one of the best things. You know, I can look back at my dad now, and if he'd let me just do whatever I wanted when I was a kid, I probably wouldn't be talking about my dad like this. You know, my dad is one of the best dads in the world. He's the best thing that God's blessed me with. As a child, it was, I couldn't ask for any better dad. He was the best thing that happened to me as a Christian. But I wouldn't be saying that to you if he would have just let me do whatever I want. And if you want your kids at the end of your life to turn around and praise you and say that you were a great parent to them, then you're going to have to do some things that are going to make them un, you know, unhappy momentarily. But that'll, that'll end eventually. You know, If they have a good heart, that'll end eventually. And now I can look at my dad and say, that's the best Christian influence I have in my life because he was a man and he did what I didn't want him to do because he knew more than me. And now I'm happy about it because I'm a grown up. Uh, but you shouldn't let your kids bully you into making decisions at your house. You shouldn't be worried about their feelings when it comes to their friends. If someone has a friend that you don't like in your house, that, you, that if your kid has a friend that they don't, you don't like, Cut that friend off. Don't let them have an opinion about that. You know, if you don't like the music that your kids listen to at your house, I don't care if they're 18 years old. Cut it off at that point. My dad said, the, the minute you move out of my house, that's when you can disobey something that I say. You know, he said, until you get married, you're obeying what I say because you're under my roof. He said, I feed you. I give you your food and water. So you're going to listen to what I say. When I was 18, when I was 19, still living at my house, my dad would have put the beat down on me when I was 19. <laughs> And I'm glad for that because I have a healthy respect for my dad and a healthy fear for it. And he helped me to turn out to be the man that I have now that I have a, a good job. You know, I have a, a car. I have a house that I can live in with my wife. And, and that's because my dad wasn't just trying to please me as a kid. He did what was the best for me as a kid. And you should look and examine your parenting and think about the things that you've let your kids do. And think, do I really want my kid to do that? Or, or do I just put up with that because I don't want to have a fight with them? Because there's a lot of parents that do that. <clears throat> Go if you would to Proverbs 12, 22. My first point of the sermon was the longest first point of all time. <laughs> but this is the second point. There's only two points in the sermon. The point two of the sermon is being honest with people. That's what tough love is. Tough love is doing what's the best for people, not what makes them feel good. And tough love is being honest with people. Look at Proverbs 12, 22 if you would. Bible, the Bible says in Proverbs 12, 22, it says lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. You know, something that I noticed that a lot of Christians do it, it, when it comes to tough love is they avoid telling the truth to people just to spare their feelings. Now, there's a time and a place where you don't have to be super harsh to someone, uh, but you should not be lying ever, even if it's a white lie, to spare someone's feelings when it comes to the truth. You know, we should be honest with people as Christian. God hates lying and he lists it in revelation 21a and he lists that he hates it right there yeah you know people try to be so unconfrontational that they'll allow things to happen in church that should not happen you should be honest with people when you talk to them especially your brothers and sisters in christ you should be honest with them you know and a good example about this is not even just with your brothers and sisters in christ is out soul winning because the Bible says in Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and, and, uh, and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You know, when you're out sowing, that's not the time to beat around the bush with people. That's the time to be honest with people and right. say, look, the Bible says that you're going to hell if you don't believe on Jesus Christ. And that's just something you need to be able to say as a Christian. You need to be able to grow up and man up and say, hey, look, I don't like confrontation all the time, but one confrontation I'll get into is when it comes to heaven or hell. And that's tough love when you think about it, because who likes to go to someone and tell them you're going to hell? I don't like doing that, and especially when someone is like super like, you know, nice to you at the door and they're always smiling, you know, and like they just seem like super sweet. You have to be like, yeah, you know, the Bible says you go to hell, you know, <laughs> it's not the that's not the nicest thing. But you know what it is? It's tough love. And that's what you have to do with people at the door. You have to say the Bible says that if you trust in your works, the Bible says you would not go to heaven when you die. That's a hard thing to say to someone. But there's some things that are worth fighting for, and there's some things that are worth being confrontational over, and that's one of them. Right. You know, the Bible says in Jude 1 22, it says, and some have compassion making a difference, and some and others say with fear, 
pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. You know, you shouldn't be trying to avoid hell in your gospel presentation. I don't think you have to sit there like Ray Comfort does on it and like sit there for like 20 minutes, you know. But you should be honest with people and say, you know, I, I turn to Revelation 21 8 every single time I give my gospel presentation. And as a matter of fact, I would go to say, if you are leaving out hell, a verse about hell in your gospel presentation, that's a failed gospel presentation because you're not even telling them what they're being saved from. If you're not, if you know, if you can't tell someone at the door that they deserve to go to hell, uh, if they don't believe on Jesus Christ, then you just shouldn't do any talking out soul winning. There's no reason for you to beat around the bush about it. That's tough love. That's things that are, it may not make you feel good. It doesn't make them feel good, but that's the most loving thing you can do in that moment of time. Uh, if you would go to Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. You know, people try to be so agreeable nowadays. There's a time to make yourself disagreeable. And that's not even my natural personality. I hate being disagreeable with people. I like to just nod my head and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it comes to soul winning, that's the the worst time in the world you can be just agreeable with people. Matthew 22, 37, it says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Uh, that this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And like I said earlier, I explained that, you know, the love that it's talking about here is executing God's commandments. That's what real love is. Because when you, if you love your neighbors and you love the people, uh, that are your brothers and sisters in Christ, then in America, they would put people to death that are worthy of it to protect the people in the land that aren't guilty of those sins. Uh, but you know, uh, if you would go to Proverbs uh, eleven fourteen real quick, as um, as I'm saying this, you know, when it comes to being honest, you should be honest with people when it comes to advice as well. You know, if someone comes up and asks you a biblical question about their life, or you know, just any question about their life, you should be a hundred percent honest with that person. That's not the time to care about someone's feelings. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about like if someone comes up to you and says, "Hey, brother, I was thinking about moving to Colorado." to start a farm right there. You know, what do you think about that? I know there's no church out there, but what do you think about that? You should tell them that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard, you know? And a lot of people, you know, they're just so agreeable that they'll say, oh yeah, I think that's a great idea. That's not love at that point. You're actually just making that person going to ruin their life. And that's the opposite of love. You're actually showing hate towards that person and you don't even realize it. When people ask you for an opinion, you should be 100% honest with them. The Bible says in Proverbs eleven fourteen, 14, where no counsel is the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And also, just so you know, if you have something that you're wondering about as a life choice and you're too scared to talk to people about it, that's probably a good indication that it's a bad life choice that you're about to make, you know? You know, it seems like everybody that's ever moved away from our church doesn't go to wise counsel about it. They don't go to my dad and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think about it? And you know why they don't do that? Because they don't want to get told no. That's exactly why they don't want to do it. You know, but the Bible says safety is in a multitude of counselors. When you have a big decision to make in your life, one of the wisest things you can do is go and ask a bunch of people about it, about a bunch of brethren about it, not just unsaved people. Proverbs 24, 6 says, for by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety if you have a big decision you should be asking people about it and not just making it on your own that's why god gave us a church of people to talk with and to fellowship with so that you don't have to make decisions on your own so that you can talk to other saved people and get their opinions about things that you'll do but some other things that i've noticed about being honest with people you know, and, and I don't think it, I should say, I don't think it's your job to just go up and correct everybody at the church. I don't think it's your job just to go to and try to be honest all the time and just be like, hey, you know, I don't think that you submit to your husband enough, miss. And it's like, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying when someone comes up and asks you for advice for something, that's the time where they've given you the mic, they're allowing you to speak and tell them the truth at that point. Uh, and what's a good example of that? When someone's out soul winning with you and they ask how their gospel presentation is, if it's not a good gospel presentation, tell them that. Don't lie to them. I've been with people before that have said, hey, what did you think about that? And I was like, I didn't think it was that great, to be honest with you. And this is why. And I, didn't, I wasn't mean about it, you know. But there, why would you let someone go and preach a garbage gospel presentation at the door? That's not love. That's hate towards the people at the door. Because you should be honest with that person and say, look, I think that it was confusing at this point in your presentation. You know, and I'm not talking about you just ramrodding everybody you go with. I'm saying when someone asks you, for advice about it. Someone says, you know, hey, what did you think about this in my gospel presentation? And it was weird. Tell him it was weird. You know, we had someone at my church. I told you guys about this last time. I'm pretty sure uh, that he was like doing some weird stuff, like bowing at the door and (laughs) all sorts of weird stuff, you know, and I told him that multiple times before, but he didn't want to hear it. You know, 
Uh, and there comes a point where you should probably go to authority about something if someone's doing weird in their gospel presentation. Uh, because, you know, the gospel's not a joke. It's not a game that we're playing here. We're trying to get people to be saved from heaven and from hell. What's another good example with clothing options? You know, if some girl asks you, hey, what do you think about this, you know, skirt or this dress or, you know, whatever the girls wear, you know, <laughs> If it's, not, if it's not modest, you should tell them about that. You should be honest with them. You know, you shouldn't lie to someone and let them go on in immodesty. You should be honest with your sister. Same thing with a job choice. You know, like I said in that other example, there's, and this is a pet peeve of mine, there's almost no reason to move away from this church you have right now. Amen. If you have, you know, you have a job here, there's, no, there's definitely no reason to move away to a different state that doesn't have a good church. That's the opposite of God's will. Right. You know, people try to like work God's will into whatever they want in their life, but God's will is never to leave a good church. And you have a great church right here. The only time you should ever leave a good church is if you're going to a different state to go to a different church that's a good church as well. Uh, same thing with child advice. You know, I could go on with a lot of things, but the most important thing that I'm trying to get across here is that you should not misguide people with your counsel because people hang on to your words more than you realize. And it reminds me uh, of the Kent Hovind thing. Do you guys remember that when he went to go get his second wife for the first time? I remember in his video he said, yeah, I talked to, what was it, like 10 pastors or 13 pastors about this, and only one of them told me it was wrong. It's like, what were those other pastors telling him? Well, they were just trying to be agreeable with him is probably what they were trying to do. But they could have saved him a lot of trouble if they'd have been honest right there because every one of those pastors should have said, no, getting divorced and remarried is against the Bible completely. Uh, but they wanted to be agreeable. So now look what he's at. He's on his third wife now. Uh, he should be honest with people. So, you know, point one of my sermon was do what's the best for someone, not what pleases them. And point two of the sermon was be honest with people. And these things are both tough love. And love is not always a gushy feeling. Sometimes love is just being straightforward and honest with people. And that, with that, let's pray. Dear Father God, I thank you so much for this wonderful day. Thank you for everything you do for us. God, I pray that you'd uh, help me and Kylie when we're on our drive home. God, I pray that you'd uh, keep us both safe. God, I pray that you'd help this uh, church to continue and grow and be zealous, God. And I pray that uh, the, the message that I was preaching, uh, that it would be edifying to people and they could keep it in their lives, God, and they'd help uh, fix the things they need to fix in their life, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.